Hello, I'm here today to present to you a snapshot of our exploratory paper, Social Dreaming Together, a Critical Analysis of Participation in Speculative Design. My name is Pedro, I'm a design researcher with a master's in strategic design at UDELT, from which this research stems from, and I'm presenting this paper on behalf of my co-authors, Roy Bender and Brecht Ivan Eichelin, both from the Department of Human-Centered Design at UDELT University of Technology. As you might know, speculative design uses design as a way to imagine and create alternative narratives that challenge and critique the status quo, open up discussion about emerging issues, and create pathways to more preferable futures. Without giving an in-depth account of its past, in recent years, the term has regained popularity in both design theory and practice, and has become an influential way of thinking about the intersection of design and futures. This growing popularity can be seen in the emergence of annual conferences dedicated to it, design awards, and it has even entered the toolkit of designers working within organizations such as Google, Deloitte, and the European Commission. However, speculative design has also been target of several critiques, such as the, narrow, the narrowness of its critique, the lack of representation beyond a narrow-centric perspective, for almost for remaining almost exclusively the domain of design authors, and that it might be giving in to commercial interests and losing its capacities as a critical practice. In reaction to this, some practitioners have adapted their practice in light of these critiques by turning to participation in co-design as a way to include those who are most impacted by future outcomes. As Mitrovic, Anna, and Elgason note, the participatory approach opens up possibilities for people to think about, imagine, but also act in creating their preferable futures. Using Koskinen and colleagues' works, speculative design might be moving from the showroom and into the field, and evolving non-designers is an important step in that move. While the intentions to include non-designers are clear, what is less clear is what exactly are non-designers participating in, or in what ways participation enacted in participatory speculative design projects, or from now on, PSD in short. To answer this question, we conducted a pilot survey of projects that self-identified as speculative design and explicitly claimed to include non-designers in the process. Importantly, our intention was not to survey the entire field as a whole, but to offer a starting point for considering the different types and degrees of participation currently deployed in PSD projects. In total, we collected 66 projects that span almost two decades, and after coding the selection twice, first using the deductive approach by clustering forms of participation in line with established frameworks like Einstein's EIP2s or Pretty's uh, typology of participation, we then took an inductive approach so we could capture the nuances of the projects. From the analysis, we suggest the taxonomy of participation in speculative design with eight categories of participation spread out through four levels of engagement. This is what we'll present now. The first category, which we call spectatorship, we don't consider a form of participation at all, but included it here uh, to establish a baseline for comparison. In this case, non-designers take the role of an audience and look at possibly interacting with the finished speculative designs. And in speculative designs, we mean artifacts, scenarios, and narratives. In the project's mitigation of shock by Superflux, the designers created an immersive installation set in 2050, portraying an apartment in a future where living conditions are adapted to climate change. While non-designers are transported to these features almost if they were there, the communication is mostly one directional and visitors have no influence in the decisions that designers took to reach this particular installation, the artifacts or the scenarios portrayed. Next level is involvement. As Nerea Cornwall notes, being involved in the process is not equivalent to having a voice. The second level includes two categories, reflection and inspiration. Reflection tends to happen at the end of the process when designers create artifacts that elicit a reaction or response from non-designers as a way to open up discussion or as a research through design tool to tap into participants' experiences. Taking, to, taking the example of the project's future of aging by strange telemetry on the top, top right, uh, this project was in collaboration with the UK Government Office for Science, and the designers created these high fidelity images that then were printed into posters and used and served as a guide for, for a creative workshop with elderly. So the speculative designs was a trigger to elicit, uh, to understand their aspirations, their concerns, and their needs in the future. Inspiration, on the other hand, tends to happen in the initial stages of the process where major decisions have not yet been made, and so non designers have more can have more influence in the outcomes. However, this does not mean that the what inspired that the, the, that what non-designers tell designers will be used in the process. In urban interaction design, 
the project by Shinendo Stalls and colleagues, the speckle design scenarios and artifacts were formed and created from the data gathered from interviews with eight non-designers while walking through the city of Edinburgh. As the designers note in the end of their paper, the next step will be to bring participants together again in a focus group and showcase the speculative designs created by the designers as a way to open up discussion again about the implications, concerns about uh, for the future. This leads us to the next level, collaboration. In this level, non-designers take a more creative role and have a higher degree of influence over the outcomes. In this, uh, here we include three categories, generative reflection, shared creativity, and shared authorship. The first level, generative reflection, designers seek feedback from non-designers, but this time is during the, the design process. And the outcomes of this feedback with these reflection sessions uh, feeds back into the process and to the next steps. This is exemplified in the last part of the project, Futures of Public Safety by Alex Kerber, where in the top, as you can see in the top, top right corner, where non-designers, where first designers created the scenarios and then invited non-designers to role play the speculative scenarios and consider which elements of this world they would want to bring back to the present and which they wanted to avoid. The next two levels, non-designers start to become collaborators in the actual creation of, of, of speculative designs. In shared creativity, non-designers take part in the early stage of the ideation process through brainstorming activities, while in shared authorship and taking example of the projects in Coffee City led by Carl Bauman, Non-designers go beyond initial ideas and become involved in the making of tangible artifacts and scenarios for, uh, in this case, for technology interventions that would happen in their neighborhood. Normally, the, uh, this would happen with technical and creative support of professional designers. And in this case, it happened with, uh, uh, in this case, design students teamed up with citizens to create the, to give shape to the initial prototypes and then create the final videos. The last level illustrates what Pell and sees as the most political feature of participatory design and an important step in truly democratizing the featuring process. Non-designers assume control over the design process, its goals and intentions using the tools and resources provided by expert designers. In initiative, the first category of this level, we can find one project called Africa Town Activation by Jasper Fran O'Leary and, uh, and their colleagues. Where, where a grassroots community group initiated the efforts to reimagine the future of what is considered the art of Black Seattle through a series of design ciphers with current and past residents where they managed to plan, design, and intervene in the space, as you can see from the photographs. However, initiating the project does not necessarily translate into control of its outcomes. In that same project, while the community developed the plans and intervened in the space, the intervention was only temporary and ultimately the development firm that owned the space continued with their planned neighborhood redevelopments. Unfortunately, the last level that we call ownership, we haven't found yet any project that would fit the description. We are left to imagine what a PST project would look like if non-designers not only took initiative, but shaped the process and maintained ownership of the outcomes and how it is disseminated. To recap, we suggested a taxonomy with eight categories of participation in speculative design that can be useful to both for, for both researchers and practitioners to analyze more uh, in more nuanced participation quality in, in speculative design projects, but also to, to, to imagine how they could shape their own projects. In the end, we looked at just one factor that might be influencing this possible move from the showroom to the field, but future research might also look into the intention, challenges, outcomes, and shifting roles that designers play in different PSD projects. For example, how is the process managed and who is managing the process? What are the main challenges? How does the aesthetic qualities of the artifacts change when they are produced alongside non-designers? How can designers capture and measure this, the potential impact and transformative uh, 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 goal of participation in speculative design? And how do designers perceive their own role when engaging in participatory speculative design? Do they identify as facilitators, mediators, curators, or agents of the public imagination? As I started from the quote from a as I started from a quote from a recent book on speculative design, I will also end with one from the book that popularized it all a few years ago and suggest that we don't need just to facilitate the dreaming process as designers, but be intentional the ways we do it and question our role in it. Thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, remarks, or feedback, feel free to contact us through the email on the screen.